I think that that moves us nicely on uh, to uh, the last element of of this talk, uh, and it's a pleasure to uh, introduce Professor Lind um, from Stockholm in Sweden, who's going to talk about pacing in uh, specific situations or patient conditions. Yes. Um, so uh, these are my disclosures, and I had the task of talking about unusual or rare conditions. And I would just uh, give this uh, presentation uh, slide where talking about TAVI patients, somewhat rare disease after surgery and high risk reflex syncope. Uh, and I do not perhaps need to talk so much about AV junction ablation since that was already done by Professor Glickson. I just maybe want to point out that these definitions of heart failure and ejection fraction, they are based on what the Heart Failure Association has decided, but putting it into wider perspective, also the universal definition of heart failure, which is made by both the US and European definitions. So um, now heart failure uh, with ejection fraction between 40 to 50% is called mildly reduced ejection fraction. And there, for somebody who is a candidate for AV junction ablation, CRT should be considered or his pacing and then accompanied by AV junction ablation. And for somebody who has uh, what is perceived as perhaps normal ejection fraction uh, to consider uh, RV pacing CRT or uh, his bundle back pacing followed by AV ablation with various recommendations, the strongest for RV pacing. So uh, these ejection fraction definitions are streamlined with heart failure association, as we just uh, said. So um, going further on, uh, I would also like to mention this study, which was not published in the guidelines because it wasn't published then, is the PAF CRT trial, which is a study by uh, Michele Brignole, in which he looked at patients who uh, were subject to AV junction ablation, cardiac resynchronization, uh, uh, because they had permanent atrial fibrillation and were not candidates for PV isolation, and they had narrow QRS and uh, had severe symptoms of atrial fibrillation and at least one heart failure hospitalization. So they were actually heart failure patients and they were randomized to either ablate and CRT or to rate control drugs. And with a long follow-up time, as can be seen here, survival death from any cause in the ITT analysis was superior in the ablate and CRT group compared to the rate control group, a group also that had worse rate control actually than the CRT group. So I think this is a population that is uh, relatively common, elderly patients not indicated for PV isolation and with heart failure uh, uh, as a previous hospitalization. So there is thus evidence that they survive uh, to a high degree with ablate and CRT. So going to patients with acute myocardial infarction, I don't think there has been very much change from the previous 2017 guidelines in that as regards those with high degree AV block, if it lasts at least five days after an acute MI, then a pacemaker is indicated. In selected patients with anterior wall myocardial infarction and acute heart failure, early implantation of CRT D or P should be, may be considered to be C. And importantly, and uh, in, in line with previous guidelines, it is not recommended to give a pacemaker if a high degree AV block resolves after revascularization or spontaneously. So going to conduction disturbance after TAVI, and here I'll go rather slowly because I find this a bit complicated, a lot of things to think about. Uh, and we proceed here with a full scheme of different conditions and with footnotes that one needs to read carefully. So if we first start with patients who have persistent high degree AV block, and or new onset and alternative bundle branch block. For those patients, 
under of the Tavi, a pacemaker is indicated when these conditions last for 24 to 48 hours post procedure. Then moving to patients with pre existing right bundle branch block, but with no new post procedure conduction disturbance. And that is defined as transient high degree AV block PR prolongation or axis change. For such patients with pre existing right bundle branch block who worsen in conduction disturbance, a pacemaker should be considered. And now moving to patients with persistent new left bundle branch block, we QRS above 150 or PR interval above 240 milliseconds with no further prolongation during 48 hours after the procedure, they should be subject uh, to high, uh, to um, ambulatory continuous ECG monitoring for seven to 30 days or an EP study. And if an EP study is performed, an HV interval above 70 milliseconds may be considered positive for a permanent pacemaker. In a patient with pre-existing conduction abnormality, but not a left bundle branch block, and uh, with the QRS uh, that widens more than 20 milliseconds or a PR interval that widens more than 20 milliseconds, again, ambulatory ECG monitoring uh, may be considered or an EP study may be considered uh, before implanting a pacemaker. So in short, Patients undergoing TAVI are at increased risk of, a of developing high degree EV block and decisions regarding cardiac pacing after TAVI should be taken based upon pre-existing and new conduction disturbances. Ambulatory ECG monitoring, and this is new things uh, with these guidelines, for seven to 30 days or EP study may be considered in post TAVI patients with new left bundle branch block or progression of pre-existing conduction abnormality, but not yet any indication for a pacemaker. So this is followed by uh, recommendations, uh, permanent pacemaker in high degree AV block, or new onset alternating a bundle branch block, uh, early permanent pacemaker in patients with pre-existing right bundle branch block with further conduction disturbance within the uh, 24 to 48 hours after TAVI, uh, in them a pacemaker should be considered. And uh, that ambulatory monitoring should or may be considered in patients with new left bundle branch block or pre existing conduction abnormality, which worsens. And, and importantly, a prophylactic permanent pacemaker implantation is not indicated before TAVI in patients with right bundle branch block and no indication for pacing. So moving now to after surgery heart transplantation, uh, these are the recommendations for cardiac pacing. Patients with high degree AV block or complete AV block after surgery uh, that is lasting for at least five days um, observation time, uh, then a pacemaker uh, uh, should be given unless it uh, resolves by itself. Uh, surgery for valvular endocarditis, and I think this is new, an intraoperative complete AV block, immediate epicardial pacemaker implantation should be considered in patients with surgery for valvular endocarditis and complete AV block, if one of the following is present, uh, preoperative conduction abnormalities, staph aureus infection, intracardiac abscess, tricuspid valve involvement, or previous valvular surgery. In such patient, a patient, a pacemaker should be considered to a level of evidence C. So, uh, we now are moving into tricuspid valve surgery, and this is uh, patients requiring pacing at the time of tricuspid valve surgery. And uh, the guidelines state that transvalvular lead should be avoided and epicardial ventricular leads used, and also that a pre-existing right ventricular lead may be left in place 
without jailing it between ring and angulus. So those who uh, are in, uh, considered after a biological and mechanical tricuspid valve replacement is already in place. But patients requiring pacing after biological tricuspid valve replacement, uh, tricuspid valve ring repair, then uh, ventricular pacing is indicated transvenous implantation of a coronary sinus lead or minimally invasive placements of an epicardial ventricular lead should be considered and preferred over transvenous transvalvular approach to AC. And in patients requiring pacing of the mechanical tricuspid valve, an implantation of an RV lead should be avoided. For patients with congenital heart disease, I think this uh, is more or less the same as before. Uh, in patients with complete or high degree AV block, pacing is recommended if patients are symptomatic, if pauses are at least three times the cycling length of the ventricular escape rhythm, broad QRS escape rhythm, prolonged QT interval, complex ventricular ectomy, and daytime heart rate below 50 beats per minute. Class recommendation one, level of evidence C. In patients with congenital complete or high degree AV block, permanent pacemaker may be considered even if no risk factors are present to be C. And radiesthesis, uh, these are recommendations for patients with myotonic dystrophy type one. If such patients have second or third a degree AV block or HV above 70 milliseconds with or without symptoms, a permanent pacemaker is indicated. And if they have a long PR interval about 240 milliseconds or curious duration about 120 milliseconds, a permanent pacemaker may be considered. For cardiac sarcoidosis, which is very common in my part of the world, in such patients, a permanent, uh, who have permanent or transient AV block, an implementation of a device capable of cardiac pacing should be considered, meaning that you may choose uh, an ICD uh, component or not, uh, to a C recommendation. In patients with an indication of a permanent pacing who have left ventricular ejection fraction below 50%, an implantation of a CRTD should be considered. So this concludes my presentation. And also I'd like to see the pocket guidelines and we have the app and the official slide set available. So thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Lynn, for an excellent presentation. Um, there's certainly uh, quite a few different areas uh, within your talk there. Uh, I guess Tavi, uh, Tavi is probably the the main one, the main um, uh, new addition uh, with the, with the uh, increasing numbers of procedures done and increasing number of patients requiring pacing. Um, I've certainly been interested by uh, a variety of different studies published looking at uh, the, the effects of having pre-existing bundle branch block and uh, developing AV block afterwards. Uh, do you think there's any value in um, in looking at AV wanky back uh, before uh, or during the TAVI? I know some colleagues that, that do this as a way of trying to predict uh, whether uh, whether patients should have a, a pacemaker afterwards. What, what do you think about that that uh, concept? Well, it seems intuitive. Uh, I don't perform Tommy uh, myself, but I, I think that um, that may be helpful. Um, some patients that I have at least refer already have pacemakers for various reasons. So, um, but I find this part of the guidelines uh, stressing that to, to wait a little bit and to do a prolonged uh, halt recording to make absolutely sure you don't give pacemakers unnecessarily. Um, so I, I'm interested in hearing what Jonathan and Michael have to say about this. If it was, uh, Kevin, sorry. So what do you do in Maastricht, Kevin? With, with your TAVI cohort? <clears throat> yeah, it's a very good question. And it's, uh, it remains a point of attention every time. We did studies ourselves. We looked at many other studies and still we don't know exactly what to do. We try to wait 
at least a little indeed. Um, of course, some patients are easy. When they develop a V block, you have to wait 24 to 48 hours. Um, we're quite uh, fast and then in implanting. However, we have also seen, as we know that for studies, that 50% of our patients actually recover uh, with EV conduction. So still, maybe we are too fast. Uh, but of course, you want, there's always this, 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 this discrepancy between you want to mobilize the patient and getting up out of bed as soon as possible. Uh, and the other side is if you have a temporary lead in a patient with a V block, you know, what's, what are you going to do? Uh, so we follow the guidelines. We wait 24 hours at least, and then we go very, very fast. And we go most of the time direction to a, a pacemaker. But then there's a second question. And then actually after this presentation, I have to defend uh, somebody. So I have to uh, uh, open on somebody's thesis. The mortality is very high after TAVI in patients who develop new left bundle wedge block and persist with left bundle wedge block or who have complete AV block and who have been implanted with a pacemaker. Should we just go for a normal pacemaker or maybe go for CRT or, or a conduction system pacing? So I think there's a lot of issues still that are unanswered at this moment for uh, uh, AV conduction disturbances after TAVI implantation. So um, we, as I said, we implant after 24 hours waiting, and then we'll make the decision to go for pacemaker, yes or no. And Professor Glickson, what, what do you do in, um, in your centre? Uh, I know there's a big push on beds. Everyone has a, a bed pressure. And I, I just worry sometimes, I think Kevin alluded to it, that sometimes we, we knee jerk a little bit too early because everyone, the bed managers, are so keen on getting patients out of hospital and and maybe six months down the line many of them don't need pacing what we have been doing is in the borderline cases such as those with the lvd that we no advanced AV block but only qrs widening or pr prolongation we have been using a lot of eps i'm not entirely convinced that this is the gold standard i do have a few patients who had normal eps or near normal it should be around 70 or below, who were released and came back with complete AV block. Um, so we are starting a study that in, in which we will do both EPS and prolonged monitoring of one month to see what's the added value of each one. We're, we're dealing with, with the details now, but uh, overall, we are not very confident that the EPS is the way to go. Um, Ideally, ILRs would do the work, but uh, it's, it's too expensive. So we are going to compare prolonged monitoring to EPS, which are two options that were measured uh, that were mentioned in the guidelines. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I certainly think that um, th that we don't want to implant too many pacemakers, but I, I do know lots of colleagues who will, uh, with, with evidence of conduction disease, pace tavi will will simply implant a pacemaker. Um, because of the likelihood um, without necessarily that, that, that demonstration. But of course, it's a case of, of, of how long you're, you're comfortable waiting and if you're comfortable waiting. Um, okay, uh, I'm, I'm interested to, to move on to the, the subset of patients and, and ask about your, your treatment of those with, with sarcoid or infiltrative diseases. Uh, does everyone use uh, CMR as a gold standard? and the uh, element of fibrosis or absence of it to guide whether they will uh, implant a defibrillator or not, or do other, other people use uh, other modalities? Uh, we have CMR available in, in the Karolinska and without further delay, so we, we use CMR. Um, and, and overall, uh, we are quite generous in, in implanting uh, dual chamber pacemakers in those patients because we rarely see that uh, high degree AV blocker solves by cortisone therapy or by itself. But uh, Scandinavia is uh, a part of the world which has a lot of cardiac sarcoidosis, so maybe we have other experience. For Maastricht, the same. We perform um, CMR in most of our, uh, try to uh, perform CMR uh, immediately after uh, when there's a suspicion of sarcoidosis. Also, as I said in the beginning, when the patients who develop AV block at a very young age, then we go directly for CMR to get uh, the evaluation of, uh, of the presence of other uh, uh, yeah, underlying diseases. Uh, I agree with two CMRs. 
I must tell you that during the, the process of the guidance, there were many people that thought we should force a specific age below which we should do a CMR. There were some discussions that it was, uh, finished, uh, it was concluded as high likelihood for inflammatory disease without a, without a specific age, although I think that in the footnotes we did mention below 60, if I remember correctly. Anyway, we do a lot of CMRs. Uh, and sometimes even uh, PET CT to, to enhance the diagnosis and to make a decision whether a patient should get uh, specific treatment beyond the, the, the implementation of the device. We, we definitely use a lot of uh, a lot of PET CT as well for our, our sarco patients. Um, if I may just uh, just finally ask about the, uh, the the more unusual cases, the rarer cases, the uh, myotonic dystrophies, the uh, undescribed uh, cardiomyopathies, perhaps in younger patients with inherited conditions, where we we have very little evidence. Um, uh, you, you'll see, I guess, a handful of these patients individually. Um, but how do you manage the the expectations of these patients, where there's really very little evidence? Um, young young patients, perhaps with a risk of uh, a family risk of family history of sudden cardiac death, but perhaps an absence of of any specific risk factors themselves. How do we manage them? Well, I mean, in my center, they are managed by the pediatric cardiologists, and and um, that also regards congenital heart block. I just think it's very sad to lose such patients in sudden cardiac death. And I'm glad that uh, there is pacing to, to treat them. That's how I see it. Uh, and then of course, management uh, has its challenges. I'm seeing quite some patients actually with myotonic uh, dystrophia. And um, uh, would we carefully follow them, follow them up from EKG regularly with increasing PR interval, QRS duration, we quite often go uh, very soon to an EP study. And, and then you can really find quite some patients with a prolonged HCV interval, and then above 70 milliseconds, we go to, uh, to uh, pacemaker implantation. We're quite strict in that. Uh, we see that it's, it's working rather well because before that we saw quite some patients actually yeah, un suddenly dying still without uh, a problem cause although we think it might be actually the bradycardia. Ventricular arrhythmias is not that often. It's really, we think, the bradycardia that is part of the problem and therefore can be treated quite easily, of course, with a pacemaker. Do you, do you think we need to have a, a larger cohort, uh, whether it be across Europe or, or, or worldwide, for these uh, this smaller group of patients? Because there's clearly a paucity of evidence for whether it's myotonics or... Uh, an Emery Dreyfus muscular dystrophy, other, other, other types of dystrophies that are clearly less common. Um, it would strike me that we're probably never going to have large studies uh, and we probably need to group a lot of these patients together in some cohort fashion to, to, to see what the right thing to do is. Well, my impression as uh, one of the editors in European Heart Journal is that there are a lot of initiatives, a lot of worldwide registry on unusual uh, cardiac disease, both in, in other congenital heart disease and in young uh, adults and in, in, in pediatric. So I think we'll find out more over time. And that combined with genetic studies will may, probably be helpful. Absolutely. I can certainly reflect on uh, on uh, a, a recent look we did at uh, a population of com congenital complete heart block over, over around 20 years that was uh, done, uh, implanted by colleagues. And uh, the, the outcomes seemed to be particularly good in, in, in those young patients with only a, a, around 10, 10 to 12% developing a cardiomyopathy. Uh, and, and the remainder actually having a very good, uh, very good long term outcome over a couple of decades. Um, so uh, I think it's important to study uh, these younger patients, as obviously as they get older, to to report back to the pacing community on how they do, because um, it's an important group that perhaps uh, there's less evidence to to guide us in terms of what to do. Okay, fantastic. Well, um, I'm very very grateful to uh, to all of you for uh, for such excellent presentations and uh, overview of the guidelines, and also to. Uh, to, to you for, for writing and reviewing the guidelines. It clearly was a hell of a lot of work.
Um, and the, uh, the data is clearly changing, uh, and as Professor Glickson said, it is a moving target. So I guess it would be interesting to see how things move forward, particularly with uh, conduction system pacing, I'm sure, for the next guideline. Um, so it remains for me to uh, thank all of you, uh, Professor Kevin Benoy, Professor Michael Glickson and Professor Celia Lind. Uh, and thank you to those of you watching um, and to uh, Radcliffe for helping support this for the Arrhythmia Academy. Uh, I hope that you found it uh, instructive and useful. Uh, and thank you very much. <laughs>